Well, the Lord be with you. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, or if you're around someone that has a Bible, would you turn with me to the book of 1 Kings? We are going to be looking at chapter 19 this morning, and we're going to be covering the first 18 verses of chapter 19. So 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 18, which means we've been continuing this series in the days of Elijah. And if you remember at the very beginning, when Elijah is called to his full-time ministry, we see Israel at an all-time low. They're experiencing a spiritual drought in which we see king after king is doing wicked and evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, we see that after the death of Solomon, Israel divides its kingdom into the northern kingdom of Israel and the, the southern kingdom of Judah. And since then, in both kingdoms, they're doing horrible. Basically, every single king you see is just wicked and embracing idolatry and going after false gods. But we find here, when when Elijah is called, we see them at an all-time low with King Ahab, who has done more wicked than all of his fathers before him. And even more than that, he marries a woman named Jezebel. And you don't always get to see who the women were that were married to these kings, but it specifically identifies Jezebel because of her wickedness. And in fact, she takes Ahab even lower than he would have gone on his own. And it says that she was an evangelist for Baal worship. That is the Canaanite god that would have been for fertility and for the storms. And we see here that she has been getting the state to sponsor Baal worship, to destroy the altars of Yahweh, the one true God of Israel, and to erect these other altars and to give him worship. And so it's in this moment with all of this sexual immorality, this idolatry, um, the injustice rampant in the kingdom, this is where Elijah is then called. And it says, the word of the Lord comes to him and he says, you are to go to address the king. So just imagine, by the way, a a no-name prophet called to address the king of the kingdom And he says, you're going to call him out on his idolatry, and you're going to tell him that there's going to be a literal drought. Not only is there a spiritual drought, but now there's not going to be rain on the earth nor dew on the earth for many years. And in fact, we find it's going to be three and a half years until there is any water to relieve the people of Israel, which means that this is a devastating and a deadly drought. Without the water, you lose crops. Without crops, you lose cattle. Without crops and cattle, people die. And so this is a death sentence for many in Israel. And so Elijah makes this declaration, and then the word of the Lord comes to Elijah again and says, now go and hide yourself away at the Cherith Brook. And that's kind of like surprising. You're like, why would he have the prophet make this declaration, and all of a sudden there's no water on the earth, and then send him away? Well, he's preparing his prophet. He's teaching his prophet. And so we know that he spent some time at the Cherith Brook being provided to drink water from the brook, and then God was sending him food by raven each day to to provide for him and to protect him and preserve him. And after a certain amount of time, maybe even a year, at least months at this point, to where the brook dries up, we know that he then was sent to Zarephath. And in Zarephath, God provides again, but through a widow, another unexpected person, God uses means to provide, showing that he is Jehovah Jireh once again. And so he provides, and he lives literally in enemy territory. This is the place where Jezebel is from, and now he's hiding in Zarephath with a widow, and God is providing for him there. But then last time what we saw is after it had been three and a half years, the word of the Lord comes once again to the prophet and says, you are now to go to Ahab once again and declare that the drought will end, but first there will be a showdown of the gods. And you are to call Ahab and all of his Baal prophets, go to Mount Carmel, and you're going to pray to your God, and whoever answers by fire will be known as the true God of Israel. And so we have that story where all of the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves and screaming out for hours and hours, asking Baal to answer them and to to burn the sacrifice. But it says that there was no one there to listen. No one heard them. No one responded. And then we know Elijah pours all the water on the sacrifice. And then all he has to do is give a 30-second prayer that is powerful, petitioning the one true God. And then fire comes down from heaven and licks up the entire sacrifice. Even the dust is consumed. And then at that moment, we know 
that the true God of Israel is Yahweh. And at that moment, we see the prophets of Baal are all killed and slaughtered, and then Elijah calls down the rain, and at that point, he tells Ahab, go to Jezreel because the rain is here. And so Ahab, in his chariot, is heading towards Jezreel, and then Elijah girds up his loins and runs past the chariot. 17 plus miles, Elijah runs ahead of the king in his chariot down the mountain. Really amazing stuff. So we see all of this going on through this three and a half years of this drought with all of this political battle and this spiritual battle going on. And you would think maybe this is the end of the story for Elijah. He had shown the king who who Israel's God was. We know that Yahweh is the one true God. He answers by fire. He answers by rain. But here we see a turn in the story. Because as Elijah gets to Jezreel, with all of this expectation probably and hope, finally Israel will have a national revival. We're going to see repentance. And the king is going to finally submit and repent of his sins and his wickedness. We're going to see the exact opposite happen here. In fact, you're going to see Elijah himself is taken back. It actually results into some dark places because of what unfolds here. Because what happens is as they are in Jezreel, it says that Ahab tells Jezebel everything that had happened. So she probably wasn't there to witness what happened on Carmel. But he says that all of your prophets have been killed. And so now Jezebel... She just continues to harden herself, harden herself off from God. And she says that I'm going to commit my life to destroying and murdering Elijah. She says, I will not sleep, essentially, until this man is killed. And because of this, Elijah sees this in the text, it says, and that he flees. Really, really weird. He's just boldly gone to the king, 850 prophets, boldly puts water on the sacrifice and can call down on his God, and he knows that God is more powerful. But here he sees that Jezebel is threatening his life, and because of that, he then runs away. And it says where specifically he goes is Beersheba. Now, for those who aren't as familiar, Beersheba is in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, he's in the northern kingdom with Ahab and Jezebel, which means he has to go all the way down south through the northern kingdom to the bottom part of of the southern kingdom of Judah. He's basically going as far away as he can get. But then it even adds, and it says, and he goes one more day further south into the wilderness. So he is now residing in the wilderness of Beersheba. And he gets to the point where he is just so exhausted that he faints underneath a tree. But while he's there, we see that God starts to show up again. God starts to speak and provide for his prophet. And so what he does is he sends an angel of the Lord to him who prepares a cake of bread and he also provides water to drink. And he has this angel nudge him gently and say, arise, eat. And so Elijah wakes up, sees this angel, which we don't know exactly how the angel presented himself. It could have taken the form of a human being, as we've seen in in other accounts. But we see that this angel gives him and provides the food, the water. He eats, and then it says after he eats and drinks, he goes back to sleep. So he's exhausted. If you can just imagine, once again, three and a half years of running, hiding, drinking from a brook, being provided for with a widow, and then having to boldly you know, uh, go against his opposition, run down a mountain, 17 miles plus, and now he's traveling all the way into the wilderness. This guy is exhausted, hungry, thirsty. So after he eats and drinks that first time, he goes back to sleep. But then the Lord sends the angel again, does the same thing, wakes him up, gives him food and water to drink, and then he says, you need to eat this so that you will be strengthened for your journey. Because the angel knew that there was more for him to do, that he was going to go somewhere else. And after he's restored and strengthened by this sustenance that God has now provided for, it says that he goes on a 40 day and night journey to Mount Horeb. Now, some of you might not really be familiar with Mount Horeb, but you actually are more familiar than maybe you think, because that's the same name, or that's a different name for the same mountain, Mount Sinai. So this is where the law was given to Moses. This is where we've seen the manifest presence of God on the mountain. This was God's mountain. And so we see that Elijah, after he's been fed and he's drank, he now goes on this journey into the wilderness to find the mountain of God. 
And now while he's in this mountain, God comes to Elijah once again. And we get this voice and this question where he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And we see Elijah respond, and you're going to see he responds the exact same way twice to this question. But he basically says that all of Israel has forsaken you. They've destroyed your altars. They've built up Baal worship altars. They've killed your prophets. I alone am left. I'm by myself, and they want to kill me now. And in response to that, God says, I want you to go and look outside the mountain. And then we see these mighty works of God. We see how all of a sudden this rampant wind comes around the mountain. Then the mountain starts to shake. An earthquake starts to take place. And after the mighty wind, the earthquake, then fire once again comes on the mountain. Pretty amazing stuff. But then we find in the text it says, but God wasn't in these things. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake, and he wasn't even in the fire. But then a still, small voice comes to him. And it's the same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Challenging this prophet to really think, what is he doing? What is he thinking about? And at this point, we see that Elijah, because he recognizes that God's there, he's hearing this question. He even covers himself, covers his face, because he knows that he is in the presence of the Lord. And then Elijah, he responds with that same statement, basically saying he's all alone. They want to kill him. He's depressed. He's anxious. He's fearful. And at this point, once again, we see God reassuring his prophet and saying, you're not alone. First off, God is right there with him. But more than that, he has reserved 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal that still love and worship the living God of Israel. And he says, I still have a plan and purpose for you as my prophet, and I want you to go and appoint some kings, and I want you to appoint a new prophet who will take your place after you are gone because I'm not done with you or Israel yet, and I am going to restore Israel. I am going to destroy all the prophets of Baal. And so we kind of see the story ending there where Elijah is getting this call to go in the will of God once again and where he is going to start to ignite this revival in Israel as he starts to appoint kings and prophets and they are going to get rid of this Baal worship. So as we think about this story where Elijah, a mighty prophet, destroys the prophets of Baal, calls down fire and rain from heaven, we then find him in this moment where he becomes fearful, anxious, isolated, and depressed. What can we take away from this story? Well, the first thing that I think we draw from it is that we see that even mighty prophets can experience depression. Sometimes when we think about these individuals in scripture, we we almost elevate them to where they almost are kind of like a Jesus light. They're not necessarily God, but they're almost like divine because of the things that they're able to do and how they're so bold and courageous at times. But I love some of the stories that we see like this, because this is a reminder and it brings us a little bit back to earth, that Elijah was a man like us. In fact, we see that literally quoted verbatim in James. Elijah was a human being. And Elijah faced the same temptations and struggles that we face. It just looks a little bit different. It's a new name, a different political leader, different culture, but ultimately we see the same temptations and the same struggles. And we find that even though he was a mighty prophet, did more than we could probably even dream in some cases, he still is susceptible to anxiety, to fear, and depression. I think sometimes we can get caught up even in our own contemporary culture, in our church culture, and thinking, well, just because he's a pastor, or just because this person's in leadership, or they've gone on mission trips, that therefore they couldn't fall prey to this. But I think this is a humble warning that even though you might be faithful to the Lord, you might love the Lord, and you may have done amazing things in the past for the Lord, that does not mean that there are not still going to be valleys and low places and times in your own life. 
I think it's really interesting because we see him win a great battle just previously in the, in the previous chapter. But what this, I think, shows us is just because you win a battle, that does not mean that the war is over. In fact, the war will never be over until Christ returns. And so you're going to find in your own spiritual life, just like Elijah, you're going to have some mountaintop moments, and you're going to have some valley moments. You're going to have some great victories in your life. But it's so important that we see this, that we cannot live on yesterday's victories. Sometimes we think that we're going to be prepared for the next battle because we won in the past. But if we aren't diligently seeking God's provision and his will, we can find ourselves in that next battle completely unprepared. We need God's grace every single day. That's why it's called daily bread. Daily manna, provision. You need God every single morning that you wake up. And so that's what we are called to do. And what we find here is when Elijah, being physically and emotionally exhausted and with his high expectations of this is the moment Israel will now finally have a revival, he's taken off guard when Jezebel says, we're going to kill you now. And so in verses 1 to 3, if you just see this, what we notice for the first time with Elijah is he doesn't listen to the word of God. Every other time, if you've noticed, Elijah goes and does something because the word of the Lord came to him. But here in verses 1 to 3, he didn't allow God's word to direct his path. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also... If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Notice in verse 3 how it says, and when he saw that, he arose. He didn't hear the word of the Lord and respond. He saw his circumstances and fled. That's what was going on there. He wasn't depending on the word and the grace of God. He was looking once again at circumstance. How often can we fall prey to doing exactly what Elijah does here? He didn't hear the word of the Lord. Rather, he allowed his emotions and his expectations guiding him. Our emotions and our expectations cannot guide us in this life. We must seek the word to guide us. Because if you allow your emotions and your circumstances to determine where you're going to end up, you're going to find yourself exactly where Elijah is in this moment. Because in verse 4, what, is that ha- what, what, what do we see here with him? It says that Elijah had had enough and he wanted God to take his life. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. This is that mighty prophet who was just on the mountaintop saying, watch this. Now he's that prophet that's saying, Lord, I don't have it. I'm done. I've had enough. Have you been that person that has said to God, God, I've had enough? This prophet here is experiencing that. And he says, I want you to take my life. He is ready to give up on life. See how stark a contrast chapter 18 and chapter 19 really are here. But that happens in our own lives. There's one chapter where we are like that, and then the next chapter, this is what we're going through. So we see here how he is experiencing this, and this is not uncommon to just this one prophet. In fact, I just want to read for you quickly a couple of other examples throughout Scripture where we have other godly men experiencing the same thing. In Numbers 11, 15, this is what Moses says. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. In Job 10, verses 18 and 19, why then have you brought me out of the womb Oh, that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I would have been as though I had not been. I would have been carried from the womb to the grave. Jeremiah, another prophet in in chapter 20, verse 14. Cursed be the day in which I was born. 
Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. And then finally, Jonah 4.3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now we know that they're going through different circumstances, different things are going on. Some of them are probably a little bit more faithful to the Lord than others. But I think what we do see here is that all of them are experiencing what is commonly referred to as the dark night of the soul. A spiritual crisis where they are feeling far from God and they are asking God to do something about it. And it seems like, and if you're not going to show up in this moment, that I just am ready to give up. This is something that I think many of us can and or will come to and experience in our lives. And we've seen this through church history. This isn't just to the scriptures. We see this throughout the church. Charles Spurgeon commonly referred to as the prince of preachers. He constantly talked about depression. He was someone who struggled with this as well. And he says, I suppose that some, brethren, neither have much elevation or depression. I could almost wish to share their peaceful life, for I am much tossed up and down. And although my joy is greater than most men, My depression of spirit is such as few can have an idea of. So he knew what it was like to be high and to be low. I know there are times for me, you know, Sunday morning is great, but then Monday is usually the hardest day of the week. Because after you have that moment where you've been doing ministry, you've been preaching the word, you've been praying and and seeking that the Lord would work and intervene, you then come to that Monday morning and it's a new battle. There's new things, new struggles, new problems. And I think that that's what's going on here with many of these individuals. They have these moments, but they also see the dark moments, the the dark night of the soul, these spiritual crises. But I think ultimately, why is Elijah experiencing this in his own life? I think it's what we all fall to do, fail to do, is that he, he lost perspective. That is why I think we find him falling into a depressive state. Elijah lost sight of the greatness of God. Now, I'm I'm not saying that he was clinically depressed. I I know that there's different understandings of depression, right? I'm not trying to give a diagnosis of this ancient prophet. But we do know what it's like whenever you have all of these things going on. And I think what we see is that at least one of the clearest reasons why he's experiencing what he's experiencing is he lost perspective. Rather than saying, I know how great my God is, he started to look down at his circumstances. He started to lose the proper spiritual perspective. And I wonder, how many of us, where would you put God on your view? How high is your view of God in your life? Because that's how we will start to compare to our problems. I've said this before, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. Because remember, Elijah had been taught time after time. Think about this. In Cherith and Zarephath and Carmel, God has been teaching him lessons. He's saying, don't forget who I am, Elijah. I provided through a brook and through ravens. That doesn't happen. I provided through a widow who was literally about to die. They were having their last meal. I provided. You even were able to experience the first resurrection recorded in Scripture because of my power. And now you could defeat the entire kingdom and all of the wicked prophets. But now one woman says, I'm going to kill you, and you're fearful? Do you notice that? Sometimes our fear, our anxiety, our depression, it's not rational. In fact, many times it is irrational. It's because we fail to have our proper perspective. You understand who our God is, the God who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who has all authority forever and ever? Why would we fear? Why would we be anxious or despairing? But see, what we see here is fear and discouragement. It causes us to only see the dark side. Jesus even warns about worry. He says, what will it benefit you? All it does is take you down a rabbit hole of darkness. That's what depression does. And so we see him losing 
perspective. And I think what we can find, hopefully, from this is that when we look at his struggles, it can better help us avoid spiritual depression or at least not become mired in it. We need to learn from his story, not say, oh, well, he was depressed, so it's okay to be depressed. Well, it's okay that we are fallen creatures and and God understands that we're going to make mistakes, but we're not supposed to just stay there and say, I want to live in depression. The point of the story is that we would learn from his account, that we would see where did he fall, where did he fail, and how can we overcome Scripture is meant to teach us, just like he was teaching the prophet in these encounters. He's teaching us through this chapter. God says, get out of that depression. You're not meant to stay there. In fact, I want you to hear the word of Psalm 42, 11, where we can challenge our emotions, challenge what's going on within us. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? And why are you disquieted within me? And then he he literally tells his soul to do this. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. So he's literally having a conversation within himself. He says, why are you so depressed? Why are you despairing? Hope in God. That's what we're to do. That is the ultimate cure to depression and anxiety. It's faith. It's trusting God in the Lord. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, we see this invitation very clearly where he says, Jesus says this, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I'm not denying that there are times and cases for additional counseling and medication in certain respects, but we ultimately know that depression is a spiritual issue, that our ultimate hope is in our God, to come to the Lord, and He will give us rest for our souls. So we see that even mighty prophets can fall prey and experience depression But we are called to move out of the depression, not to stay mired in the depression. And I think the ultimate way that we do that as what we're seeing is to hope in God because we know, as we see in the text, that we are never alone. You are never alone. I hope people will hear this this morning because there are times that you're speaking to yourself, your soul is telling you, no one understands you. Nobody cares about you. Nobody is listening. You are so sinful. You are unworthy of grace or forgiveness or or any type of community or sense of belonging. But that is exactly what the enemy wants you to believe. See, the enemy wants you to think that you are all alone, that there is no one else. And that is exactly what Elijah started to buy into. And in fact, you hear him say it at least twice. And at one point it even says he left his servant. He left the person that was with him to go and be in the wilderness. So we see that Elijah, he started to isolate himself and feel all alone. But in verse 9 and verse 13, we see here clearly God was with Elijah in the wilderness. Are you in the wilderness right now? God has not left you. God has not forsaken you. He will never leave you. In fact, we see in Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. This is saying that no matter where you are at, in the highs or the lows of life, you cannot flee God's presence. God is with you and he offers you his grace. He will strengthen you with his right hand. He will never leave you. 
And in fact, if you find yourself and you're just thinking, I'm just in such a dark place, spiritually, emotionally, it says that God can overcome that darkness. That even darkness is not dark to him. There is nothing too dark for the light of the world. And that's what I think Elijah begins to experience here. And more than even thinking about how God is omnipresent, he is everywhere, you can't flee his presence, we have an even more precious truth in the gospel, don't we? Because what Jesus accomplished is that we have his presence within us. Christ dies on the cross, rises from the dead, and then says, I'm going to ascend so that I may send the helper to you. And because of Christ, you are now spirit-filled if you have placed your faith in him. The Spirit of God, the manifest presence of God lives within you wherever you go. So even if you are in a dark place, I want you to understand that the Spirit is light inside you. There is a light that can overcome the darkness, and we find it in Christ. And so this reminds us that we were not created to live in isolation. We were not created to be like Elijah, hiding in the wilderness or living in a cave. Rather, we are called to live in community. Community with the Lord and community with one another because isolation is depression's best friend. Some of you need to hear that right now because as soon as you get depressed, you feel anxious, everything starts to go bad, you immediately say, I need to go remove myself and go hide away. But that is the absolute worst thing you can do. You need to remind yourself that you're never alone, that God is with you, and that also he has provided a people for you. The church is here for those who are suffering, for those who are struggling right now. If you aren't okay, come to us so that we can help guide you and assist you and show you love and support. That's what the church is about. And I think we see a little glimpse of that in verse 18 because what we see here is that Elijah, not only was he not alone because God was with him in the wilderness, but we also see here that he wasn't the only one left in Israel. In fact, it says that there were 7,000 people that were still serving the Lord. They were fighting the same fight he was fighting, but he was so focused on self-pity that he was missing it. Sometimes you just need to look around and recognize all of us have battles. All of us have a war until Christ returns. And so we can maybe help and give encouragement to one another because maybe somebody just got through that battle and they can help you find the cheat codes for it. We need some help and support and love. We have to remind ourselves once again, when depression comes, you are never alone. But the final thing I want to draw from this is that when we think about being alone, or about how God is with us, sometimes we're like, well, I don't feel like I'm seeing that Mount Carmel moment in my life. You know, there was a clear point where everyone knew that Yahweh was there when the fire came down from heaven. But I think more often than not, we're going to see that God works in the stillness and subtlety of life. So often we want to see the Mount Carmel moment, and that doesn't mean that that moment won't come in life at times. But more often than not, we're going to see God working in the stillness, in the subtleties. Or more specifically, you're not going to see the, the spectacular all the time, but rather it's going to be the gentle whispers of life. And I just want to draw out a few examples of that from the text as we're closing this morning. Think about in verses 5 to 8 how God is patiently and quietly giving Elijah rest and nourishment. See, God could have given him a sermon right then and there and rebuked him and saying, why are you sinning? Why, where is your faith? I'm getting rid of you. I'm going to find a better prophet. He doesn't do that, does he? Rather, he lets him go. He lets him sleep. And then when he wakes up, angel's there, not a sermon. Rather, here's some food and water. Eat and drink. And then go back to sleep. And then wake up again, here's some more food and water. Before the conversation happens on Mount Horeb, there's a lot of other things going on. This is God in the stillness, in the subtlety, providing, meeting needs. And sometimes that's exactly what we need in our own lives. Sometimes we think that there needs to be this huge spiritual moment where we can get restored and, and overcome depression. And sometimes, you know what the answer and the antidote is? Sometimes it's good food and good sleep. And that's exactly what we need. Sometimes we separate 
the spiritual and the physical, but we need to recognize we're both of these things. We are spirit, but we're also body. And they interact and affect one another. Have you ever been stressed and then it causes you to not want to eat or it makes you nauseous or vice versa? Have you ever been in pain and then it makes you really crabby or take it out on other people? It's because they're interconnected. And so sometimes the way that we can help with our mental health or the things that we're going through, our depression and anxiety, sometimes you just need to take better care of yourself. Are you eating healthy? Are you getting the proper amount of sleep? Are you exercising? I know that whenever I started ministry, I really started to get into lower places more than I'd ever, I'd never really experienced anxiety like I had when I started full time. But then as I started to do it, it got worse and worse. And then I started to work out and exercise, which I had stopped doing for a period of time. And I noticed that just alone, I didn't even change my diet. I drank a little bit more water, but drinking a little bit more water and exercise alone, I would say took about 80% of what I was experiencing away. It's crazy what just taking care of your, your body will do for your soul. So we see this happening where God is gently and, and, and subtly taking care of his prophet through just physical means. But then we also see this beautiful verse that so many of us probably have remember, uh, memorized and maybe even have on some art in your homes about how we see that God came to Elijah with a still, small voice. I want to read this again in verses 11 and 12. It says, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. So many times, that is how God communicates to us. It's not with a windstorm, firestorm, an earthquake. It's he's speaking to your soul. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you, prodding you, encouraging you, saying you need to get to church. You need to call that brother or sister in Christ. You need to get in the word more. Come talk to me about your problems. So often, that is the way that God communicates to us. But if we get so caught up, and here's another thing, I know for the younger people in the audience, we have social media and we have all of these other platforms and mediums that you're constantly hearing stuff. I feel like even in my own home, there's regularly that you don't hear quiet and silence because there's just something always playing. So often it's hard to hear that still small voice because we're listening to so many other things, so many other voices. And so this is why quiet solitude is so important at times. You need to get away from the world, not to isolate, but rather to to commune with the Lord. And so we need to make sure we have time to hear that still, small voice of God. And that voice is going to bring you peace. That voice is going to give you comfort and guidance and direction and purpose in your life. And that's what we find with Elijah. He got a new purpose. You're going to go and you're going to um, ally yourself with these other individuals who are also serving me. Because in verses 15 to 17, we see this call here. And I just want to read this as as we're finally closing. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Now, how this applies to God working in the stillness and the subtlety is that we find here is that God wasn't going to send revival through Mount Carmel. Rather, the way that God was going to overcome Baal worship was going to be solved through slow political processes. Think about this. It's going to go past your lifespan, Elijah. And you're going to anoint these kings over here and this prophet over here, and through this political process, eventually you're going to see revival. You're going to see the victory. 
this is a humble reminder for us as the church, as we are going to war, as we are proclaiming the gospel to the nations, is we don't look for a Mount Carmel moment necessarily. Rather, what we look for is these people we continue to appoint and guide and, and ally with that we see victory over victory, and eventually we see Christ return. And that's what we actually see Jesus promise us for the kingdom In Matthew 13, 31 to 33, it says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. See, the kingdom of heaven is not like Mount Carmel. Rather, it's like the gradual subtleties of life, where it's going to slowly grow and expand and mature. And it all started with that still moment where a baby was in a manger and then a man that nobody knew from Nazareth was put on a cross. That's the beginning of the kingdom. And we're going to see what will take place when Christ returns. So we are to be like Elijah learn from his mistakes, and do what he does well. We are to see that we are never alone in the dark places, and that we see that God is working in our midst, even if we don't always see it or, or expect it, the, or it's not happening the way that we expect it. We know that he is victorious, and that he is working, and that his kingdom is coming, and Christ will return, and all will be made right. Every single idol Um, every single false god will be destroyed. Anything that you are experiencing in your own life, depression, anxiety, it will be conquered when Christ comes back. So that is our hope. Let us depend on that grace that is promised to us in the gospel message. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We are so grateful that we can come and gather together as a community of believers that we recognize that our fellowship is in Christ and that because of him, we have all that we need, that we are never alone because we have you within us. We have you before us, behind us, beside us, above us and below us. We know that you are always with us and we also see your body in the church. We see our brothers and our sisters who walk alongside us on this journey of life. And I pray that we would be better counselors and encouragers as we walk through these these difficult seasons of life. And ultimately, Lord, I pray that we would see and hear your still small voice, that we would recognize that you work in the stillness and the subtlety, and that each day your kingdom is getting closer to us. And that is our ultimate hope. So Lord, we give you praise. We rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen.